always a person, so I made it. Oh, my hair. Well. Um, well, indeed, thanks for the great introduction. And also thanks for turning up here. I, uh, well, especially with your festive days and your extended weekends, it's really nice to see such a big crowd. Um, and I hope I won't disappoint you. Uh, so if I see stupid faces or so, I'll just speed up and, uh, and, and run to the end, OK? Um, anyway, if you have questions in between, uh, uh, please be, be welcome to ask them. I'm happy to explain anything further. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about today is, uh, well, multimodal instructions, basically. I'm, I'm working on those for a while now. I'm trying to figure out how that works in those uh, documents. I, I'm still not totally finished here with my setup. Yep. Um, and um, let me see. Um, my talk outline, I made one, so that's useful. So at first, I'll give you an overview. At first, uh, the introduction there, I talked to you a little bit about computational linguistics. Um, how many of you heard of that? Because I hear I'm talking to linguists, right? So uh, computational linguists. Yeah, any experience there? Any, any experience around that thing? OK, so I'll give you a brief introduction there. And I talked to you about digital humanities too. Have you heard that uh, term before? Digital humanities? Who has fingers? Oh, okay, so well, there's a few. Good. I'll uh, hopefully explain to you the relevance of that as well. As a context for what I really want to talk about to you today, and that's the multiple non-structures, and I'll talk about the design of those and about the effectiveness of those. So I'm uh, going to tell you how we try in Chromium to um, investigate how these multimodal structures are designed and whether they're useful. And um, well, there's the details. And then, of course, a bit of future work on uh, well, corpus extensions. So not only multimodal instructions, but also other things. Hopefully, we'll do that in the future as well. And the automation of all the things I'm going to talk, talk to you about. Um, so first, that introduction. So computational linguistics. So I can give you a very boring uh, definition here, right? The branch of linguistic that applies techniques of computer science to the analysis and synthesis of language and speech, right? So what do we, do we know now? Well, we know a little bit, right? But um, I think we, it's easier to communicate this uh, just by example, right? So we all know uh, Google, right? We all use Google every day, right? So, and what does Google do? Well, Google uses a lot of methods, computational linguistic methods, to deal with your questions, to deal with your requests, right? You type in your words, if you, if you want to search something, right? So you type in your words there, you type your keywords there, and then you retrieve information. So what does Google do? Google actually figures out what you want to find, searches in a whole bunch of data, really, for those terms, and then tries to match your search as well as possible. Right? So that's what Google does. So suppose we typed in multimodal representation, right? Something I'm interested in. What do we get? Well, we get uh, something which go, it, well, some, some categorization here. Google makes us a categorization, right? So it says all, it says shopping, whatever that may be, right? So somehow it's able to retrieve documents which are related to shopping when we're looking for multimodal representation, right? So there's something going on there. There's computational linguistics, so the big, the big in back, background there. We can also retrieve pictures news and videos all on multimodal representation. Well, you know all this because you do this every day, right? Who, who never does this, right? Well, maybe not for multi-representation, multimodal representation, but you use Google, right? So I'm going to uh, drag on about this. Uh, anyway, what I'd like you to, to see here 
is that you type in text, but you get back pictures, videos, text, and documents which are somehow related to a particular topic, like shopping or um, what else was there? Uh, tools, no, tools probably something else. I'm, I'm not really sure. Anyway, shopping uh, or news, that was it. Anyway, okay, so that's you're using computational linguistics every day. That's my point here, right? So that's what we do. And uh, also, your personal assistant. Well, I'm actually using Siri or Siri, whatever. What, 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 what do you call this thing? I'm having a, an Android system, so it's not working on that. But what you have here is a machine which actually gives you an answer to your request, right? So this, this is computational linguistics too. You produce a question, you just ask Siri, uh, well, whatever, uh, or Siri asks you something, in this case, what can I help you with? And this is all text-based, right? This is all text-based. So somehow, this computer is able to find some meaning in what you're telling. It, right? And it's also able to search a big database to find an answer that matches it, right? So this is again computational linguistics. Um, wouldn't it be nice now to have a personal assistant that also gives you pictures, right? That if you ask for, well, in this case, a multimodal instruction, for instance. In this case, what you see here is two, actually two screens. And this is uh, an application by the Red Cross, right? And this is one screen. It's a bit of a old picture, so I'm pointing it out. And this is uh, the second screen. So in the first screen, for well, this application, you can use when somebody's well, dying, basically, right? So uh, <laughs> you have that somebody who is well not well, and you have to figure out what is going on with that person, right? So and then you have six options. So you match have to match that situation with one of these six options, right? So in the end, well, okay, you say um, uh, you choose one uh, for for reanimation or uh, you know defibrillation or whatever, and then you get uh, a procedure which you can follow, right? And this procedure <coughs> is um, uh, contains a, a number of steps, and all these steps contain a bit of text, an instruction, an action to carry out, as well as a picture in which this action is visualized, right? And also, you have a bit, a button here on top, which actually, which can actually audio the text which is presented here, right? So if you have no time to read because you're saving the person, right? You can tap the audio key and, and listen what you need to do, right? So this is already what we're doing. Um, <coughs> but is it really the case that this instruction is what we need at that, at that moment? If we need to read something, we can audio read, uh, listen to the audio there, and we need, we need a picture. But I'm interested in how this information presentation, text, action, instruction, procedure, and the, the, the stepwise uh, separations there, um, um, what is that, that's effective. Well, anyway, so this is all uh, a bit lost now. Uh, well, just, just an assistant which I, think I wanted to show you here. So, but, this, this was the question I was already asking, well, what is the best way to present this information in such a critical situation, right? We want to have this information in the right way, all uh, right? So, for that, we need to, have, to find out, well, to think, basically, how is this information actually presented? How do people do that? How do, do, do uh, designers put pictures and text together? And are these presentations effective? Do they work in practice? Can people work with them to save lives? Right? Um, and there um, uh, is, well, this is for the humanities, I wanted to introduce that too, because I'm interested in finding out how these, uh, what these designs look like, right? So this is for the humanities there comes in to the picture there, because this is an academic field, and you've heard all about that. Uh, they combine digital technologies and humanities, right? 
and DH involves collaborative, transdisciplinary, and computationally engaged research, teaching, and publishing, right? Again, a boring uh, type of um, definition. So, and I, oh yeah, mind you, you also have this here that you already knew, right? And also, I want to point this out, this is a European framework here, uh, which actually uh, involves a lot of about infrastructure to do this type of research. Well, what type of research is this actually? Um, has to do with archiving, right? So we're archiving, we're continuously archiving. You have your books in your, uh, in your house, in your, in your library, right? And lots of paperwork, right? That's what you all have, that's the old way also for a bit. And now you also have your computers with all the documents in it, right? And now and then, you want to find one of these documents, right? And that's not always that easy. You want to retrieve missing documents, right? So how do you retrieve documents? So this is digital humanities too. So if you want to archive documents, you better archive them right, right? So the way in which you archive your documents is very important because you want to retrieve your documents as well, right? So one way very important way to retrieve documents is to annotate those documents, right? So you may have done this, right? You, you probably have done this, right? You have looked at texts and you made your marks on those texts to, uh, to, to make, well, actually pointers for yourself to look at those texts later on and find those places, places back, right? And you can probably imagine that if you want to do this on a, a big uh, archive, right? You may want to do this in a very more systematic way, right? So, and then you make your categories to make particular annotations, which you can you model your annotations and you can apply the model to well, multiple documents at some point. So that's what we're doing in the digital humanities as well, and that's what I'm doing in my um, um, project on pictures and text. I'll talk to you more about that now. Because, for instance, if we take Google again, uh, and I type in, I want to have all first aid instructions with, which consists of three steps, three text steps, and three pictures, right? Google basically cannot do it. Right? You just get a lot of information back, but it's not those instructions that consist of three steps in text with three corresponding pictures. And I want to be able to retrieve those from a large corpus of uh, instructions which have text and pictures. Right? So that I can make uh, out what the similarities and differences between those um, documents are. So. This was uh, the introduction, and now I'll move on to well, what I'm doing, uh, what I'm doing with this uh, this type of research. So first, uh, design, and then the effectiveness of uh, multimodal instructions. So multimodality. In this case, you have an example. There's numerous people who've looked at multimodal documents. Multimodal documents, I mean documents that consist of pictures and text, right? And numerous people have found that in, in all kinds of research disciplines, like linguistics, uh, like uh, media studies, like cognitive uh, style as a college, all these people found that pictures improve the clarity of those messages, right? So in this case, you, well, you cannot read it, I don't expect you to read it, so I'll walk you through it a bit. Only from the outline, you already can see that there's like a number of pictures at the top of the document, and that this may be a title, right? Then there may be a bit of an introductory text, and there's a few bullet points, which probably have some actions in it, and, well, because I'm talking about instructions, right? So there's probably some some actions there or uh, steps to take into that instructive uh, procedure. Okay, so this is one example. So if you well, Google again, 
that's like Google, um, <laughs> instructions on how to remove a tick, right? They find a lot, yeah? And they will differ, right? So the different terms of text, right? This is uh, uh, similar, like a uh, uh, title, introduction, and a few steps, only they have four. Well, here ha we have a different setup with about seven bullet points, right? What does it mean? Uh, the pictures are in between the titles on top of it. Here's some pictures, uh, uh, titles, and well, uh, a few bullet points, and another paragraph there, or you know, whatever you call it. Uh, and here is, well, oh, for change, there's the pictures on the left side of the text, right? So designers do not know what to do here. Right? They do, they do something, and they hope it works. Right? So I'm interested in well, what are they doing, and uh, what do they do mostly, and well, can we test that in practice? Can we test what it works? Anyway, first, first part of that is actually trying to annotate these types of documents, and I already pointed out a few things that you can uh, um, Talk, uh, uh, say about these things like titles, uh, placing of pictures, new number of steps, etc. Right? Uh, so, what is the effective combination? What's the effective combination? We don't know. Okay. So, in the path project, path census for picture to text, right? Easy. In the path project, we systematically investigate picture text combinations in both one instructions. Right? Okay. So, how do we do that? This is our method. Uh, we analyze the MI, from now on, MI is not the instructions, right? We analyze the MI designs and that's, uh, and, and the, uh, we evaluate these things. So, for analysis, uh, well, we collect a corpus with all MIs in it, and then we develop an annotation model to annotate, code the text, the pictures, and the relation between them. Right, so that's over here, and I'll talk you through some examples uh, in a minute. And uh, to add, you evaluate these things, well, we, we, well, we develop an evaluation method, and this uh, concerns whether we're using readers, whether we're using users, this makes a difference, I'll show you later on, and what type of measurements we use to evaluate these things, is it about recall, is it about attractiveness of these things, uh, understandability, well, we can all measure all kinds of things, I'll show you later, and the context of it. Anyway, first, uh, uh, the analysis. So for corpus development, uh, we need collectors and annotators, and well, in Chromium, I have uh, a, a, a lot of well, really good students, actually, who are help me uh, gather multimodal instructions. And uh, so in, in my master course on multimodal instructions, there's about 10 to 15 people every year, and they collect together about 200 MIs every year. So uh, currently we have well, almost about 400 now after two years. And they annotate them as well using a scheme for that. And with that annotation scheme, well, we have in the, in the annotation scheme, we have 42 categories for text, pictures, and their relations, right? Um, this type of documents we use uh, this year, basically. Uh, this year was a bit different from last year uh, because I was uh, in contact with Herr Orange Kraus, the Orange Cross, if you like. Um, and these, this, this organization, um, publishes um, materials for people who want to obtain a certificate, the first aid certificate, right? And they do that every five years, they bring out a new book. Yeah? And uh, they just last year, they, they brought out a new book, and they're interested what are these instructions, and I actually did better than the previous ones. So in this case, you see one of uh, 2013, that was the previous book. So this is basically an old one. Right. I'll talk you through it and then I'll show you the, the new version for the same uh, instruction. Right? And then we can figure out together perhaps what the differences are. It's quite obvious, I'll tell you. So uh, here's the title, here's eight steps, right? And these steps contain lots of text. 
right? This is learning material. So these people do not have to save someone immediately, right? There's nobody dying, but they have the time to study the procedure thoroughly, and then, um, well, they test it later on. Um, uh, what are they, they, well, skilled enough to get this uh, certificate. So what we see here is eight steps with a lot of text, three pictures, and this is the next page, uh, on which there's a blue text printed out with uh, three bullet points as well. Um, and well, I can tell you this is a bit of a, a warning or explanation for special patients. Uh, this is the actual instructive instruction. And what you also may be able to point out here that there's uh, numbers here, the number four, which actually is an explicit reference to step four in the procedure, right? So already there is a link there, right? And this is not always the case in these things, in this business. So this is uh, 2030. Oops, sorry. And this is the new one. And well, they, you can see it's a huge difference, right? So um, we have here a lot more pictures. Uh, actually, we have. <coughs> Seven steps now, so one step less. I'm not sure how that works, but it's the same procedure, but they're able to, to do it in one step less. Anyway, uh, and then uh, you can also see that there's not this neat split up in the sense that there's text on the right side and the picture on the left. Now the pictures are all over the place, and even uh, uh, extra as well. These three pictures here on top uh, show you a special case for. What did they say again? Uh, small people. Not kids, small people. It's really nice. Uh, anyway, so this is a special case with three pictures for small people and um, a warning, right? With extra a warning for, for well, what to do with small people. You cannot just. <laughs> uh, it, it, yeah, well, there's, there's, there's special uh, things to do here. Anyway. Uh, um, but it's in between, that's what I wanted to point out as well, it's in between just step three and step four, right? And then suddenly this, this. and then on the other, uh, other side of the last page, now three pages, this instruction, there is this, this blue inset with extra information on the, on the um, well, on, also on special cases, like, well, you have to have your, well, it, 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 you cannot apply this on hairy chest. For instance, that kind of information is in the blue bit right? So this is um, what we're looking at. And what we tried to do was to figure out what is the structure of this book, what are the big topics in them, and what are the uh, tasks that actually need to be learned by the people who want to have the certificate, right? The serious information. So, uh, and, and then we try to match Mark those, uh, those those topics from the uh, new book to the topics in the old book, and then we found out that well, the, there was a well. That's that's what we, we did, and then um, the next thing we did was um, also find alternatives by Google on the internet, right? So then we have this is how we build a corpus, right? Two books from Edward uh, Dash plus. Uh, alternatives on the same tasks from the internet. Um, and now we want to describe them. Well, I already showed you now how varied this material is. So there's text of pictures and there's obviously also relations between them, otherwise they wouldn't be on the same page. And our research questions now are how can we describe pictures, text, and the relation between them, right? And in which way, if you know that, if you, if you know how to describe this, uh, we can um, say more about the way uh, designers combine pictures and text. Right? So that's what we're interested in here. And we use a coding scheme for that. And I'll uh, walk you through it again. So we have some metadata for every document. We say something about the text, we say something about the pictures, and we say something about the picture-text relations. In, for the pictures, we have something about the form of them um, and the function, and the same for the pictures. Right? So metadata, well, if, if we just know down what was the title, what was the description, what was the user group, children, adults, 
uh, my days, whatever. Source is, and what are they, what, well, what are these things used for? They're used for to do something or to learn something. I already showed the difference there. Uh, or to decide. There's more examples later. And uh, for text, you look at form and function. So form is, well, how are the actions um, presented? Mostly in terms of imperatives. Uh, what is the address, formal or informal? Uh, is there any dices that we have familiar terms, right? German English. Right? Good. Um, pronouns, etc. So that's what we, we're looking at, for instance, right? So uh, functions as well. So how is the action specified? Are there any warnings, explanations? And this is more difficult, right? You can imagine that these things can be done automatically, right? With computational linguistic methods. But these things are more difficult. We need human eyes to do the human brains to do this. Uh, for pictures, it's the same. So we can say, well, it's a photograph, a drawing, but it is pictograph, text, indices, errors, etc. in those pictures. And uh, then there's function. So sh is, there, is it a batch? Is it picture showing an action, or is it picture showing a result of an action, or a warning signal, or whatever? What is in there? And the uh, relations there as well. Picture text, mappings, reference numbers, I already pointed out those numbers, icons, lines, etc. So that's what we're looking at, right? 42 categories for now, for the whole document. Uh, examples. So, what is an MI? Again, so in this. These things we find too general, too, too global. So there's one picture and there's a few. So this is not what we're looking at. This one, uh, the same, this is more like a, an infographic or so, or a decision tree, right? We're not looking at those items, we're looking at these things, right? So steps, or maybe no steps, but a, a procedural uh, instruction and some pictures to go with it. Um, target audience. So now, walking it through the coding system, right, or parts of it. So in this case, what well, we have a, this is for kids, right? The pictures are childish, uh, the, the text is easy, right? So we recognize that as for kids, right? Uh, but now we want to annotate this in such a way that the computer at some point also is able to recognize it as for uh, a, a kid, uh, a, 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 yeah, for kids. This case is more for medics, right? There's a few uh, um, terms in here which are not immediately recognizable for everyone, right? Um, I had to look them up anyway. And this is maybe for adults anyway, for, for, for in general, right? Also here you can see lots and lots of difference already. So there's four steps, there's three pictures, there's two steps, uh, two, two numbers here, so which uh, instruction, which action uh, has to deal with, uh, has to do with this, this picture, etc. There's lots of problems here already, but this was meant to point out to the target audience thing. So learning, doing, or deciding, this is also something that what we're looking at. So if you want to save that life immediately, right, you don't want to read a lot of text. It needs to work immediately, so there needs to be a little text. So, um, the, the material I showed you earlier from the Orania Kruis is, is obviously for learning. There's lots and lots of text, with lots of pictures, with lots of things to study. And this guy is not so certain, really. This is quite a difficult one. If you can see that there's a lot of inference here going on, so you have this first part, which is you first have to decide you know, whether the victim is conscious or unconscious. Right? So check the situation, see what is conscious, and choose one. And then if you choose, for instance, the victim is conscious, then you have to make another decision, right? So uh, can breathe or cannot breathe. And based on that decision, you have to again check your reality here to make sure that you uh, find the right action to, to carry out. So this is about deciding. Right? This is very difficult information to, to deal with in, 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 and to code as well. Um, warnings, explanations, and advice. So here's another example again. Um, seven steps, pictures and text, right? In this case, they organize very neatly. And then there's a lot of information around it, which may be distracting, right? 
uh, what type of information is this? Well, this is signs of life. It's actually explaining you to, uh, well, wh whatever you can expect when you're looking for signs of life, right? Um, oh, um, there's uh, at the bottom here, there's a few examples of materials you can use to, uh, um, uh, well, to, to save the life again. Uh, so this is extra information which goes beyond the actual instruction, right? So how do we code this? That's the question. So we're trying really hard. Um, number of actions, right? So we're interested in how many actions are actually need to, well, do you need to carry out to reach your result, right? And then if you want to count those actions, you might even come across uh, fairly uh, difficult examples, like there's also things apparently in this section which you cannot do, which you shouldn't do actually, so negated actions. Uh, do you count them or not? What do you do with them? Right? This is for, for, for linguists very easy to recognize, but within the context of an instruction, very difficult to deal with. Yeah? Um, affordance of human body from that now I'm moving to the pictures a little bit more so this is what we're looking at in pictures usually very often anyway uh, pictures in first aid instructions do have well, a victim uh, now then there's a helper too and now then there's some objects there as well so if you want to do some image processing you're probably able to recognize those right Recognizing the actual action which is presented is a lot harder, right? So if you're able to uh, figure out who's the victim, right, um, then you still, well, somehow infer what's going on in the picture. So maybe that's a of interest there. But uh, for now, uh, affordance, well, we're trying this. Um, in this case, for instance, it shows just how to use your hands, right? When you want to, uh, um, um, uh, well, when you, when you want to uh, defibrillate someone, uh, this this shows you where the where you should be as a helper, and where as a, as uh, in relation to your victim, and where this this machine actually should be, because there's there's wires on that machine, right, and they're just so wrong, right, so there's a, you need to figure, and you do not have time to figure this out already, so it's easier to have a picture there, which actually shows you where to put the machine and where to sit yourself, right, so that's where we are calling for them for human body, or, uh, yeah. uh, then the number of pictures, also nice. Uh, so straightforward in this case, where you have two pictures to step, for instance, here you have a number of uh, icons or symbols, right? So what do you count, right? Again, we're looking at the whole uh, instruction. And uh, symbols and text in pictures, well, this is an example with uh, lots of uh, text also indicating that the person, the helper in this picture, is actually calling for help, right? So this is not the instruction, this is not the action, well, it's visualized action, but it's not instructed action. Uh, well, visualized, so there's a, there's a difference between the text there and the question. Well, um, I leave it with these examples. Well, I hope I've convinced you that this is very difficult material to describe. Yeah. So if you have a workbench, I'll uh, go briefly through that. Um, this is actually a tool which we build in Chromium. Uh, to systematically investigate uh, the design of multimodal instruction. So currently, uh, we tailor this to the first aid domain and instruction specifically. And, and past then, uh, the past workplace facilitates storage, annotation, and retrieval of MRIs. Right? So this is what it looks like. Uh, so this is one uh, screen where you can have within the big corpus, you can have your own corpus, right? And you, this is the, these files all represent one of your MIs, and then you're able to annotate them separately. And the nice thing is that you can also invite other people to annotate them, so that you can do some inter-annotator agreements to, to see whether you actually agree on your annotation. 
Um, so this is then, and uh, it's all a bit uh, difficult to read, I understand that, but just to, to show you, well, there's some <coughs> linguistic annotations here in front, and then there's, uh, well, you can do the image annotation as well, you can also have various views on your documents. Um, so this is just to show how my students work with this in trying to annotate those um, uh, instructions. And then if they've done that, they build the corpus together, right? They build together a corpus which is annotated. And then uh, in, in, with the, the categories I just showed you and more, um, and then they're able to search in that corpus, in a corpus which they build together, and instructions, I'm very enthusiastic about this really. So, so uh, instructions that actually have three steps, yeah? three sets of text, and three accompanying pieces, right? So we can do what Google, Google cannot do, basically. Right. So I'm a bit proud of that, I'm sorry. Um, but it's nice. And uh, actually, we want to do more, because at the moment we can do a, a, a retrieval of full document based on full document annotations, but we also want to look at the structure bit further, right? To see, uh, do some refinement here in document segmentation. So, in identification of layout, elements, tags, and pictorial elements as well, and the annotation of relations between those elements. And I gave you an example there. Um, this pig, right? So I'm going to worry a bit with the pig now. Um, so in this case, well, we have a title here, we have some steps here, and we have uh, a few pictures. I showed you this in another example about the pig as well. And there's another tick example here, and this is the tick in the wild, right? And the, these are three of uh, uh, five steps to take. Basically, it's pick up the tweezers, pick the tick up, uh, pull it out, clean the room and uh, write down the date on which you did all this, right? So that's important, and then there's an insert here. So from, from the full MI annotation, we now want to be able to identify these, uh, these bits and pieces in the document, like this, right? So here we have pick up the, the tweezers, etc. just the, the five actions I basically mentioned, and then we can see that there's also five actions visualized here, and then the, the, we suddenly figure out that this is extra information, some additional information actually, so if you have uh, a problem uh, uh, within three months uh, after the, 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 the stick bit still, then go to your GP, uh, something else, and here's another conditional. So there's extra information there as well, which does not really, well, it relates obviously to the instruction, but it's not the instruction itself. So how, if we are able to identify all these bits and pieces, code them, right, then we can also find the relations between them. Then we can see that, for instance, in this first step, the action that needs to be carried out corresponds to the first picture, right? And then we can see that this second step actually contains two actions, right? So then you can, of course, wonder whether it's wise to have two actions in one step, or whether you have to, and then we come to real life and the effectiveness of all this. Well, anyway, this is to show you where we want to go. Um, and now, about the effectiveness, like what do we need to do, how many steps uh, do, we, do we need to have for uh, in the instruction, how do we need to relate to the pictures, how many actions per step, etc. of all these numerous variations. And uh, our research question in evaluating all this is, well, which features make MIs effective? And this is dependent on, where, on the task. Are you, people, uh, are you asking people to read instructions or are, are you asking people to perform the instructions for real, right? Also, what do you measure? And I'll give you a few examples here. So what we typically do with learning material, we want to do uh, classroom evaluations, of course, in a setting where this material needs to be learned. Right? So we have, I've heard you uh, also know the term AHBO, so I don't need to translate that in English. So uh, we, we're, I'm working together with a, 
koninklijke Nederlandse vereniging EHWO in Groningen. En we zijn heel happy with that, because I have my master students working on these annotations all the time, looking at these instructions, looking at how these things fit together, right? And then we, I, I take them to the AHBO, and we have an instructor DJ, and we're having this instructor in front of us, and he's telling us how to actually conduct these instructions. And it's very different from what is actually in the document. And if you, if you try to figure this out in, in real life, it's very different from what is on paper, right? There's lots of motivations to do particular actions or to make particular moves which are not in the actual instruction, right? And then we figure it out in, in an actual learning context. Um, also, of course, uh, this, is, this is very important to have these people uh, around because um, they also have access to numerous people who want to obtain uh, not five minutes, all right. Who uh, wants to obtain such a first aid um, uh, certificate, right? So uh, that's nice. Uh, that would be nice participants for a study, right? We also do these lab-based experiments. It, it just looks a bit scary, perhaps, but <laughs> in this case, well, there's two people sitting here. It's the same lab. This is a male and this is a female, and they're uh, they're having. <laughs> They ask you to banish their food, right? And we want to have this in a very strict, uh, strict environment. So we actually want to measure this very uh, methodically. So we have to put their food on a cross on the on the on the floor, right? And and then that's where they uh, and they're on the swivels, yeah. So they can change easily from the practice uh, with the bandage and the food to the instruction itself, which is on the table, right? And then we can actually measure, in that way we can measure, how often they need to consult that instruction, right? So if they need to consult the instruction more often, you can actually figure out, well, maybe there's something wrong with this instruction. It could be improved, right? But if it, if it would be better, then you didn't have to consult it that often. Well, that's the type of experience you can do. We're also doing, well, take removal experiments, right? And we use eye trackers for that. And in this case, well, we have a, a tray with a puppet on it and a pin in it because we cannot really place a real life take on uh, the participant, right? That's ethical, not, not really nice thing to do. So we have this puppet and we have all the, the objects that are necessary to perform the five steps in the instruction procedure. Um, and we place the person in front of a, 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 um, an eye tracker, and which is actually registering how they read the text, right? And also whether they look at the pictures, right? And how well they read the text. So the red bits are indicating that there's uh, more fixations here going on than in the, in the more yellow bits. The bits the white bits are not uh, looked at at all, right? And here we can see that the pictures are also look Anyway, we had in this case 22 uh, participants or mothers, which is for their caring for their child. Before. It was also very difficult to get for the fathers, actually, so we the hospital mothers. And um, so they did have uh, no first aid certificate, nothing, no experience with tick removal, etc. So we asked them to do this. And we had four conditions, right? The conditions were very um, similar in that they all had the same pictures in the instruction and the actual same text, right? It was only organized a bit different, right? So text on top, picture, uh, uh, sorry, picture on top, text there, four conditions. So text on top, picture below, and this, uh, these are the other two on which the, the picture were on the either side of the text, right? The text was all the same, right? So, and all the pictures as well. So what happened? Well, all the, all the people in all conditions, five, five persons only for conditions, not very large experience, but very extensive and in, in terms of work and, uh, and, and uh, uh, data processing. All were equally um, understandable, right? So no problems there. But scores vary enormously when it came to uh, performance, recall, and attractiveness. When we asked people to actually do this, uh, this was actually the winner. 
the winning condition, in which people first read the text and then uh, looked at the picture, and then the next line, right? So this is how people uh, work through an instruction like this. And here you can see uh, this in more detail. So these are the four conditions in vertical uh, lines. Uh, one second, five seconds, etc. Ten, twenty seconds. Here, at this point, they had seen all the instructions and they moved towards the reality, right? right? And actually removing that tick. And then you can see that if they were presented with the pictures first, that they actually skipped them, right? They turned first to the text. Here as well, they first look at the text. And then actually, when they've read all the text, they're not very much turning back to the pictures, but they're moving on to removing the actual tick, right? Whereas in this case, as I said, reading the text, looking at the picture, reading it, etc. And this is the condition in which people looked indeed at all the pictures. Right? Importantly, in this case, I, I find it very interesting finding that after people uh, looked at this uh, condition, for instance, so now this condition, so they had read all the text, they didn't look at the picture, they had to switch back to the instruction more often than in this case, where they actually had seen all the pictures, right? So pictures do <coughs> help. Pictures are important, but it's also important where you place them. Anyway. This was the bit on most more instructions, but I'll uh, give you a little bit uh, more, if you have still are uh, with me here, yeah? right? <laughs> oh my God, I have no clue of time, maybe I totally lost it. Yeah, okay, I'm over. Um, uh, future work. So what we do want to do, do is automation. So automatic annotation, and I'd like ideally to have some playful environment and uh, use get the identification there to collect annotation via crowdsourcing uh, to automate document segmentation, we already do that a bit, uh, but this, this needs improvement, uh, and use that, if you have all those segments, you can do uh, more NLP, natural language processing, right? Using parses uh, to, to annotate text, and do image processing, and we already mentioned that as well, so we can uh, see which objects are in there, but the, the actual actions are a bit more difficult. And of course also automatic evaluation. So if you can collect evaluations of MIs from people, from users, uh, via crowdsourcing on MIs, which are actually annotated uh, from of which we know what, uh, what, what information is where, then we can use those evaluations to evaluate uh, new instances make learning algorithms that actually can, uh, well, which you can actually present a new instruction uh, and they just tell you how good it is. Um, and then production of effective minds, yeah, well, formulate offering guidelines, obviously, well, I already mentioned one, right, put the pictures on the left, uh, semi-automatic generation, at some point we may be able to do that as well, if you know more about text relations, we, uh, I hope to uh, well, be able at some point to generate it automatically. And for instance, have that an instructor, I uh, borrowed this from Northeastern University, so I have an instructor, an Asian there, which actually gives you a picture and, uh, and a bit of text that actually comes at the right time when you're, uh, well, want to get rid of the stick, right? Uh, we want to focus, however, on the more life-saving procedures, and this is also, well, on request, basically, from the ordinary crash, uh, so resuscitation, defibrillation, and also turn to the side is a very life-saving operation, I learned, because, well, people can uh, um, um, choke on their own vomit, for instance, right, so then you need to, to turn them uh, to the side, or to, on their side, for uh, and well, put pressure on the one. Also, life-saving operations, which people tend to forget. Right? Um, corpus extension, or well, ideally, obviously, we want to go beyond those uh, uh, first aid instructions and see whether those uh, methods and algorithms also can be applied to other types of uh, communications. 
and uh, well, have a look at video, but well, I don't really hopefully convince you that this is already very difficult to do material, so imagine that all these things would move as well, and you have a little uh, music in the background or whatever, noises, uh, which you need to annotate as well, right, so this makes, makes it more difficult. Very importantly, my acknowledgements here to, um, most notably, uh, Professor Dr. Kisela Reiziger on Sarkonian, uh, and many, many students of which I uh, uh, only mentioned a few here, and of course the Centre for Language and Information in Colonial which will make this so very possible. Thank you very much.
Yeah. You were using some users. Right? Yeah. Do you collect metadata of these users as well? It might be very good for the future. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're trying to, uh, well, you cannot bother these people too long, right? So you need to make very strict designs, really, to anyone to test them all in the same way, right? So that was the picture with the, 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 the bandages and the, and the foot and the, and the cross on the floor for. Um, but, um, so they need to carry out this instruction, obviously. Uh, then we want to ask them uh, some questions about the instruction, but also on forehand we have some questionnaires there for the, to, to gather some demographics. And there's also included some self-efficacy um, uh, questionnaires and um, uh, something else, a need for cognition questionnaires, in which people show uh, well how interested they are in learning something, for instance, right? So we gather some information about the, the, the participants in our study to be able to uh, well to to explain our results uh, well, with more more insight. Yeah. 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 analyze the text and uh, uh, perhaps also uh, algorithms just to learn the content of the pictures and whether they're instructions or not. Do you think uh, coupling the two somehow feeds back into each other to help? Like yeah. the results from the text analysis uh, to help yeah. to see if the picture is an instruction or not? Definitely. I think we need to do that at some point because, well, as I said, we can uh, recognize objects and people, but we cannot recognize the actual actions. So we need the text uh, to, to figure out what actions need to be carried out in the instruction. And if, because that information is there, we can hopefully also uh, relate it somehow, and we'll have to see how to do that, but relate it somehow to the picture of my pictorial information. Yeah, yeah that's a beautiful job. Yeah. So very initial work, actually, this is. Thanks very much for your attention and uh, interest. With joy. Thank you. Yeah.